Some of you have heard the story we heard this morning in Matthew before. How many of you think you know the story? Oh, trick question, right? Trick question, right? It's a story that we've heard over and over and over again because everybody tells it, and the Gospels actually retell it. And actually, Matthew has a different telling of another feeding story later. The feeding of the 4,000 actually happens next chapter in the Gospel of Matthew. Here we have the feeding of the 5,000. But how many people were actually fed? Right, the last verse said 5,000 men plus the women and the children. So was it 5,000? Was it 10,000? Was it 15? We, we don't know. I actually did some figuring this past week, though. If it was based upon the average American family, which is 2.5 children, I still want to know how a family can have a half a child, first of all. But the average American family is 2.5 children. So if we figured that 75% of these men were married and that they each had the, the typical American family, that's 18,125 people that were fed that day from five loaves and two fish. Now that's one heck of a happening, is it not? It's an amazing thing that happened. And that's what we see when we read this story, and that's what we come away with. Is it, it's amazing. Jesus took five loaves of bread and two fish, and he fed all of these people. But if that's the only thing we see, then I think we miss an awful lot. You see, there's three things in this story, in these short verses here that we had this morning, that we miss because we're so focused on five loaves and two fishes. There's at least three things that we miss. One of them is compassion. The second one is plans. And the third one is what I like to call what happens behind the scenes. Those of you who have been in some kind of musical or stage production know that what happens on the stage is minuscule compared to what happens to make what happens on the stage happen. Right? And that's exactly what happens in God's world as well. What happens out in front of people is minuscule compared to what happens behind the scenes. You see, the first thing here we have is God's compassion. We even hear about it in our psalm this morning, right? God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We see God's compassion. Our story starts with when Jesus heard this, he went to go to be in a solitude place, in a solitary place. He wanted to be by himself, right? What had just happened? Somebody just lost his head. John the Baptist was just killed because the daughter of the king asked for his head on a wooden platter. And he was just killed. And when Jesus heard this, out of compassion for his friend, rather than holding up what the powers of the day would say, he wanted to go out and be alone so that he could pray and, and mourn the loss of his friend. Right? Jesus just heard that John the Baptist was murdered by King Herod, and so he wanted to take some time to be alone and mourn the death of his friend. And in first century thinking, in Jesus' time of thinking, gods aren't normally supposed to care about the minuscule people in the crowd. They're supposed to hold up Herod and what Herod just did and not worry about the people that he's mistreated. Gods of ancient philosophers were often considered dispassionate. And gods of the Greek and the Roman Empire were notorious for playing with humans and using them as playthings in the way that they wanted to see things happening. They ordered humans' lives in order to have fun. To make humans go through things that we shouldn't have to go through. Those are the gods of the Greek and Romans. Gods are not supposed to take the side of the last, the last, the lost, the least, or the little. They're supposed to take the side of the rich and the powerful. They're supposed to stand with people like Herod and his well-fed party guests. He's sanctioning what they do to the poor, holding up what they just did to Herod. Jesus is not supposed to be mourning Herod as a god. Jesus, as a God, is not supposed to be mourning John the Baptist, right? I wanted to make sure that came across clear. <laughs> Jesus, as God, is not supposed to be mourning the passing of John the Baptist. He's supposed to be upholding what King Herod just did. This is not what gods are supposed to do. Gods are definitely not known for siding with the oppressed, the ordinary, the downtrodden, or the hungry 
And yet here we see a God of compassion in Jesus who mourns the death of his friends going against the powers of the day, who cures the sick because it says in our reading that Jesus, when he got out of the boat and saw the crowds, he had compassion on them and he cured the sick. Anybody who was sick, he cured them that day. And he feeds the hungry. And what we now call food scarcity, right? There are people all over the world who don't have enough food to eat wasn't only known in the ancient world, it was much more rampant than it is today. So the disciples' suggestion that these people should go and buy food isn't just unrealistic because they're out in a deserted place. It's completely ridiculous because there wasn't enough food for these people to go and buy, even if they had the funds to go and buy it anyhow. Right? Even, it's a little insulting what the disciples say to Jesus, that these people should go and do that because... They don't have the money to do it. And so Jesus, this God of compassion, tells his disciples to get over their callous self-concerns and to feed this massive crowd themselves. Which is where we get the plans. When people needed to be cured, they came to Jesus. And Jesus did what? He cured them. He healed them. Right. When people are hungry... Jesus tells the disciples that they need to feed these people, right? Which tells us that prayers are answered in two ways. One, God takes care of it himself, and two, God asks us to do it for him. Right? But Jesus tells the disciples that they don't need to send the crowds away because the disciples need to go and feed the people themselves. You see, the disciples' plans are to send the crowds away, that they may go into the villages and buy some food for themselves. The disciples assume or hope that the village markets will be able to cope with what the crowds of 5,000 plus. Contrary to Jesus' teaching, they look first at the imperial economy to supply the need of these people rather than looking to God to help in this need. Right? How often are our prayers asking God to bless our plans rather than asking God what His plans are for us. How many times are our prayers asking God to bless our plans, rather than asking God what His plans are for us? Right? Jesus tells the disciples, they do not need to go away. You, you give them some food. The word you here is emphasized in the Greek in its order in the sentence. And it's emphasized not only because of that, but the, it is an imperative verb. How many people know what an imperative verb is? I got one hand. Really? Come on. Our, our former kindergarten teacher back here knows. Yes, right? See, she knows. Yeah, I know she knows. An imperative verb is a command. It's a command. Jesus isn't suggesting to the disciples that they do this when he says, they don't need to go away. Maybe you could give them some food. That's not what he said. He said, don't send them away. Give them something to eat. You give them something to eat right now. Why does Jesus do this? Why does Jesus turn to the disciples when all they want to do is take some time away and spend time together as a group to send these people away? Jesus says to them to go and do this massive task. Perhaps this is something the disciples needed to hear. You see, when Jesus sees sick, He heals them. When He sees people who need to know something, He teaches them. When He sees demon-possessed, He exercises them. When He sees the hungry, He provides food. And when He sees the disciples, He challenges them to go out and do what God has called us all to go out and do. You do something, or more specifically here in our verses this morning, you go and feed these people. When God hears our plans, He laughs. The best starting line to any movie ever. It's the, the movie is My Sister's Keeper. In the very first line, it comes out on the screen after the opening of it, and it says, you want to make God laugh, tell Him your plans. He hears what we think we're going to do, and He laughs, because that's not what's going to happen. Rather than asking God to bless our plans, we need to make ourselves available for what God has planned for us. Which brings us to what the disciples did that morning. Have you ever thought about exactly how much work it would take to feed or distribute food to 18,125 people? 
let alone 5,000. You know, if we go with the number that I came up with, it's 18,125 people, right? And then not only distribute that food to them, but then you've got to clean up the mess. I see the people in here that do the meals and stuff, their eyes are just about ready to bug out of their head. Could you imagine if 18,125 people came through here for booyah? Wow, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's an insurmountable task, really. Right? Do you think it's significant that Jesus says at the end of this story, or it's told to us at the end of this story, that there were 12 baskets picked up? And there were 12 men doing the distrib distribution here? Because you see, it actually would have been so much easier for Jesus to do what the disciples had asked him to do. To send these people away. Which he actually does do a little bit later in verse 22. It would have been so much easier on the disciples if Jesus had said, go ahead and disperse them. There certainly could have been other ways of feeding this hungry crowd too, right? Jesus is God after all. There's other ways that they could have fed this massive group of people without the 12 disciples having to distribute all of this food, right? If Jesus was going to miraculously make food appear, why not just make it appear in their stomach so nobody has to eat it? Then nobody is using any energy at all. There's no, nothing to put out. There's nothing to clean up. It's a beautiful thing, right? Jesus could have done that as God, right? But Matthew emphasizes that being a disciple is more than being just someone who learns from Jesus. It's someone who also works for Jesus and allows Jesus to work in and through them, right? This text suggests that the disciples need to be stewards of what meager resources they have. These five loaves and two fish, right? The five loaves and two fish that were meant to be the meal for the 13 of them alone. Right? 13, Jesus and the 12 disciples. That was supposed to be their meal. But the disciples are shown through this text that we need to be stewards and good stewards of the little things that God does give to us. Sometimes for divine miracles to occur, the disciples have to work their butts off. Can you imagine not only feeding 18,000 people, but 12 of you doing it? Do the math real quick. That's 1,500 people a person. Right? You have to feed 1,500 people and then clean up after them. Perhaps that's the difference between disciples and the crowds. While all received the benefit of the meal, right? The disciples got to eat as well. So, you know, you get to serve these people, but then you also get to sit down quickly and eat your food before you have to get back up and clean everything up. Everybody got to eat. But the disciples had to make it work. They had to work and work hard to make this miracle happen. And then they had to get up and clean up the mess, each one of them gathering together a basket. Now, we, didn't, we don't know how big these baskets are, but I imagine it's not like a little basket that you'd put flowers in. I imagine it's a big basket, probably about yay big around. I imagine it's probably about that big, tall. So, full of fish and bread. It's not a, it's not a small task. In many of these 18,000 people sitting there, how many of them do you think actually saw Jesus take the bread and lift it up to heaven and give thanks for it? Think about that for a moment. Have you ever been in a big crowd? Is it possible to see everything that's happening? The only people that probably would have seen Jesus lift the bread and pray for it would have been the 12 disciples and anybody who was close in around him. Anybody far enough back would not have even seen it or known about it at all unless word spread through the crowd. So many of these people probably didn't even know that Jesus had lifted this bread and this fish and that there was only five loaves and two fish. The disciples saw it, Jesus handed it to them, and they distributed it. However the story is interpreted, Jesus is charged to his disciples, stand, you give them something to eat. The source of the feeding is God, but the resources are human. The work of the disciples, the bread of human effort, is honored, used, and magnified by Jesus. No matter how it happened... It was done through the disciples and through God working together in harmony. How many of you know what the slogan of the ELTA is? 
Anyone, 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 anyone. We're going to learn it this morning and we're going to live it. We're going to love it. Because it's not, not only because it's the slogan of the ELCA, but because it's a good thing for us to do. And it's what we absolutely do and what we see done through this text this morning. The slogan of the ELCA is God's works are hands. God's works are hands. Which means God does it through you. Whatever God does in this world is done in and through us. Right? God's works are hands. Often God's miracles take a lot of human work, exactly like our miracle today in our Gospel of Matthew says. And this real wonder, this real miracle continues to happen day in and day out today as we go out from this place. God still cares deeply and passionately for those who are most vulnerable, for the poor, for the immigrant, for the sick, for the demon-possessed, for the hungry. And God continues to use us to care for everybody who needs His care in this world. As we come to this table this morning, we'll receive this same miracle, the miracle of bread and wine, of body and blood. We receive Jesus coming to us in this bread and this wine. And how does that happen? It just happens because we believe that it happens. We believe that Jesus said that night as he sat there before he was crucified, that this is my body and this is my blood and I've given and shed for you. And we do this because we believe that. And we believe that it gives us God's grace in and through us. And because of that, then we can be sent out into the world to share that same grace and that same mercy and that same love with everybody else. We receive from His hand through the hands of others. Right? I get the, the honor of standing behind this table, but it's not me that's saying those words. It's Jesus that's saying that's those words to each and every one of us. We're receiving the bread and the wine from Him through the hands of other people. We need to go and do likewise, just as He gave to us. We need to go and share what God has given to us. So we need to do what Jesus told the disciples to do. You, go and give them something to eat.